I just finished packing up a 20-foot U-Haul. I didn't really like driving such large vehicles, but it will probably save us hundreds of dollars in moving costs. Mia was going to follow me in her car with the kids. We had to be in town by mid-afternoon. I was looking forward to this change. Although I loved living in Stanhope, I knew Mia couldn't wait to get back to the city. It was where she grew up and went to school. I met most of her friends, and they were all mostly good. Mostly. There were a few stories that I think she censored for me. I knew she had a bit of a wild past. But I reasoned, her experiences made her the person I married, and my experiences did the same for her. I had grown to love her over time, I knew that. But I questioned my decisions from time to time. Because of this, and because of one particular incident, we almost didn't get married. The circumstances surrounding our marriage were not ideal. But let's start at the beginning. I think the history will make more sense. I graduated from Stanhope State University with a degree in business. The summer after my freshman year, I interned at Northern Forest Products as an assistant broker. NFP sold lumber all over the world. The main office was located on the Stanhope campus. I enjoyed learning about lumber, building materials, and the different customers who bought products from us. It was a fast-paced job. In addition to products and customers, I learned several important things about the business. First, it was a high-pressure job with goals, deadlines, and pressure to perform. The other thing I learned was that the guys who were good at it made the big bucks. After graduation, I started working at NFP as a sales intern. I worked for an experienced broker named Larry Belinsky. Larry was a big, somewhat scruffy guy who was well-versed in the lumber business. For the first six weeks, Larry and I worked side by side in the office, and I learned a lot. After those few weeks, Larry rarely showed up at the office. I quickly realized that you don't have to be physically in the office to run a business. Most of the time, I was just socializing with people who were literally all over the world selling lumber. As time went on, I did more and more of Larry's work. I never knew exactly how much he made in commissions, but I heard enough to know it was a lot. Meanwhile, I was earning an intern's salary. In this business, as I soon realized, it's all about telling the truth and getting people to trust you. I later realized that this lesson doesn't just apply to business. Relationships do too. We'll come back to that point in a moment. Shortly after his first full year on the job, Larry started showing up at the office less and less often. From what I understand, he began having health problems. He had been divorced from his third wife for a little over a year. Despite his income, he lived in a mobile home in a park on the east side of Stanhope. He may have been a good lumber salesman, but his personal life was a mess. Between the office and Larry's house on the east side of Stanhope was a bar called Timbers. It was not uncommon to see his aging Chevy Tahoe parked not quite level in the Timbers parking lot at all hours of the day. On Monday, almost two years into my tenure at NFP, I arrived at the office to a subdued atmosphere. Pretty quickly, the information reached me. Larry had suffered a stroke and was now in a rehabilitation center. No one knew what the long-term prognosis would be, but it was expected that he would not be able to return to work. In the meantime, we had things to do. That Monday afternoon, I was called into the sales manager's office. We talked briefly about Larry, and then the conversation quickly turned to business and future plans. We're not going to give you 100% of his books, he told me. But you've done a good job, Patrick, and you'll get most of it. And I was happy that they thought I was doing well enough to take over at least part of Larry's business. In fact, since I started working with Larry, our business has grown. It wasn't until a few weeks later that I realized the financial implications of my new status. My first monthly commission check was just over $14,000. And that wasn't even for the entire month. That Friday, upon returning home, I did some quick calculations. Even under the worst-case scenario, I calculated that I would be making a nice, small, six-figure income. I was excited, encouraged. I also felt some remorse toward Larry, but the reality was that I didn't know him that well. I needed something to celebrate. I called my buddy Tim Paris. Tim was still in school getting his master's degree. Price, what's going on? He answered. He always called me by my last name. Sen, I explained that I wanted to take him out to dinner and a couple drinks to celebrate. Celebrate what? He asked. I said I would explain later. We decided to meet at Poncho's, an upscale Latin restaurant with a great bar. One of those places you couldn't afford in college but always wanted to visit. On Friday nights, it was packed. There were professionals and fresh out of college students getting their first job. I told Tim about my new lucrative business at NFP. I didn't give him exact numbers, but I hinted that I expected to make money. Price, he began. 
You know I'm getting my MBA in finance. I interned at a financial services company last year, and I have an offer to start work in June. We need to develop a financial plan for you. And we began discussing my plan. As we talked, the restaurant became busier and busier. We were standing at a high bistro-style table with stools that seated four people. Large company was beginning to invade our space. As Tim and I were discussing stock indexes, I felt someone tap me on the shoulder. I turned around and there stood a tall, striking, dark-haired woman, actually a girl, who was smiling and looking at me. Do you use this stool? She asked, still smiling. I'm not usually a very social person, but I wasn't an introvert. I was just stayed. But today, encouraged by my financial success, I was in an uplifted mood. Yes, I said. But for you, I'd be more than happy for you to take it. I smiled back at her. She thanked me and pushed it back about six inches, still quite close to Tim and me. Tim chatted briefly with a skinny blonde girl across the table from the one I was talking to. The tall girl smiled at me once more as she sat down on a stool and turned to her friends. N After a few minutes, I asked the girl next to me if we could buy them a drink. They agreed, and the four of us started chatting. As the evening went on, there was more drinking and more talking. I learned that the dark-haired girl's name was Mia Durant. She graduated from Stanhope State University, earned a degree in marketing, and worked for a local advertising company in Stanhope. The more I interacted with her, the more I found her attractive. We left Poncho's and went to a small bar called Pinocchio's. It was a little quieter there, and we ordered a few appetizers and had a few more drinks. The night was getting a little foggy because of all the drinks, and at some point I realized that Tim and the blonde had left. Well, Mia started. It's getting a little late. I'm only a few blocks away, she said to me. I gallantly said I would walk her home. We reached her door and she turned to enter the code to unlock the door. We entered the apartment. Soon we were in the bedroom and got down to it. After a while, we fell asleep. It must have been hours later when I felt her move. Good morning, she said. We both got dressed, chatting about the previous evening and smiling at each other from time to time. Once out of the house, we sat down at the breakfast table and had coffee. Eventually, I realized I had to go, but I enjoyed their company. I learned that the blonde girl's name was Lisa Shea, and she was a good friend of Mia's. I also learned that Tim and her had spent some time together. He didn't stay out all night. I'm engaged, she explained, as if that made logical sense. I'll have to check with Tim, I thought. Well, I guess I better go find my truck, I told the girls. Mia walked me to the door and kissed me sweetly goodbye. I had a really good time with you, Patrick. Text me. She said, I left happy and satisfied. I was still encouraged by my income realization. I was in a good mood. I thought about Mia for a few days before contacting her. Like I said, she looked great. She was fun to be with, and she was good in bed. But, I thought, I'm not really into casual dating. If I'm going to put energy into a relationship, I need to make sure it can be long-term. I called her midweek. Hi, she answered. How's Patrick doing? I could tell she was glad to hear from me. I'm glad you called, she continued. I was hoping it wasn't another one-night stand. Another? I thought. For the moment, I pushed those thoughts to the back of my mind. We agreed to meet up the following weekend. Over the next few weeks, we started dating, seeing each other mostly on weekends, usually staying at my apartment and sometimes hers. A typical date was dinner, a few drinks, and then back to my apartment. Sometimes we'd go out with friends, mostly Mia. I saw Lisa, Mia's roommate, a few times and decided to check in with my friend Tim to see how that first night went. I called him on my way home from work one day. Price, how's it going? Answered Tim good-naturedly. Still making the big bucks? Now that I'm working full-time at investment counselors, we really need to put together a plan for you. I agreed, and we made small talk for a few minutes. Finally, I brought up the night we met Mia and Lisa. I asked him what had happened, blaming alcohol for his lack of memories. Oh my God, began Tim. You looked like you were having a good time with the dark-haired girl. I agreed. Anyway, we got there. Fun, but almost too much so. After we had fun, Tim continued, she tells me I have to leave. Her boyfriend or fiancé wasn't sure what was wrong, sometimes came in late and had a bad temper. It was definitely getting interesting. I hadn't been introduced to the bride, but I knew who he was, Mitch, something like that. I think I got dressed and left after about 60 seconds. I was going to find you, but I just caught an Uber. Crazy night. What's up? He asked. Another weird thing she said to me. I kind of forgot about it. What? I asked. When I was leaving, she told me, and stay away from Mia, 
Last time Mitch stayed the night, she almost entertained him. It was all a blur. Then I heard her laughing and guessed it must have been some kind of inside joke. Tim finished. It made me wonder for a moment. Had this really happened between Mia and Lisa's boyfriend? It seemed unlikely. It was probably just a joke, just as Tim had suggested. I told him I had a good time, but left out all the details. He quickly changed the subject. Hey, there's a Stanhope Stars home soccer game in a few weeks, and the company has tickets. Do you want to go? I said yes, of course, and we agreed on a Saturday game. I loved September soccer games. The weather is usually nice, unlike the rainy, cold November games. Mia and I continued to date, and so far it was great. I have to say that in the back of my mind, I was a little worried about Mia. She hadn't done anything special that I was aware of, but from a few things she mentioned about her lifestyle, she seemed a little more wild than I was used to. The next weekend was Labor Day. I asked her if she wanted to go camping with me. I told her how much I loved being outdoors, hiking, fishing, and occasionally rock climbing. You mean, she asked uncertainly, sleeping in a tent? I assured her that she would love it, that I had all the gear she needed, and promised her a good time. She agreed with noticeably less enthusiasm than usual. That weekend, the weather was perfect. We camped in a state park with more modern restrooms rather than porta potties. We cooked on a camp stove and made a fire in the fire pit at night. About midway through Saturday, she started to give up her reservations and began to really enjoy the outdoors. That night at the fire pit, she asked me what we were going to do tomorrow. Have you ever been fishing? I asked. She hadn't, so I told her about a secret fishing spot I knew about. And we'll have to walk a few miles to get there, but it's worth it. I told her, and she readily agreed to give it a try. The next day we got up early. We took our backpacks, fishing gear, water, and light snacks with us. I had fished this creek before. To get to the fishing spot, we had to cross the creek at a certain spot. When I fished this spot, I never saw anyone else in this part of the creek. We set up, I got Mia's rod and reel out with a lure and showed her how it worked. There was a big flat rock over a clear pool where I told her to try it. I said I'd walk down the creek for a bit, but that pool would be a good spot for her. Over the next hour or so, I caught a few fish. One of them was a good-sized rainbow trout. I had to explain to Mia about catch and release. I was already a little upstream from our spot when I heard Mia's excited shout. I caught one! I caught one! She yelled. She had caught a medium-sized trout. I took a picture of her with the fish. She was very excited. That night at the campfire, Mia leaned her head on my shoulder and put her arm around me and whispered in my ear. You know, Patrick, she began, I'm starting to really like you. I smiled, feeling the same strong feeling for her. I felt like we had just completed a turnaround in our relationship. It had been a good weekend. Dead dead. Usually during the week, we would see each other at least once. This week, we decided to go out to dinner on Wednesday night. As we sipped our wine, we started talking about the upcoming weekend. She mentioned a party on Saturday night. It's at a friend of Mitch's, she told me. Mitch Markham was the fiancé of her neighbor, Lisa Shea. I'd met him a couple times, and he seemed like a normal guy with a big ego, kind of like a college fraternity. I also knew a friend of his who was throwing a party. I'm not sure I can make it, I said to Mia. There's a soccer game on Saturday, and they usually leave pretty late. Oh, right, she said. I really wanted to go to the party with you. I told her I'd try, and then we started talking about other things. That Saturday, Tim and I went to a game. The Stars were playing a ranked team, and the stadium was filled to capacity. We had a couple beers before the game and another at halftime. Surprisingly, the game was still close in the fourth quarter. The other team led by three points and got the deciding touchdown with less than a minute left in the game. Their quarterback threw a pass to the sideline that was intercepted by our defender. The crisp pass was slowed by a tip, and our defender snatched it out of the air and returned it for a stellar touchdown. The Stars had defeated their rival. The entire stadium, except for a few opposing fans, went crazy. Tim and I sat for a while amidst the celebration. Eventually, we began to slowly leave the stadium in high spirits. Even though it was late, almost 11.30, we were enthusiastic about the soccer game. Hey, I said to Tim, do you want to stop by the party? He agreed. I started thinking about Mia. If she left, maybe she and I could hook up and end up at my house. My excitement was building. When we got to the apartment, the party was still going on. Tim and I walked over to the keg and sipped our beers while talking to various acquaintances. I was also scanning the crowd looking for Mia. So far, I hadn't seen her. Tim was dragged off somewhere with a girl he knew, and I was just chatting near the keg. 
I was standing with my back to two guys, still students as I realized from their conversation. I could hear them looking at the girls, making remarks. It was funny eavesdropping on those two. Look at that, one of them said. That remark caught my attention, and I turned and saw that they were looking up at the stairs. I saw a girl and some guy coming down the stairs. She was hugging him. She looked a little disheveled. Her hair was must. Her makeup was a little smeared. But there was no doubt who it was and what she was doing. The guys behind me described her exactly. It was Mia. I froze for a moment. My first impulse was to rush toward her, but then I hesitated. I didn't want some dramatic encounter to happen at this party. I had experienced this kind of scenario before. It was messy and awkward. I decided to leave. I sent Tim a quick text message. At parties like this, it's every man for himself. He replied me with a thumbs up. As I walked to my apartment, I thought for a long time. Mia and I didn't give our relationship any formality. We hadn't promised each other exclusivity yet. I guess I couldn't blame her. But I also didn't think I wanted to be in a relationship with a woman who would have fun with me one weekend and someone else the next. I reasoned that I shouldn't be mad at her, but I also thought about what I wanted for myself. I wanted something more than weekly dates. It was obvious that we had different goals. By the time I got to my house, I had come to a decision. No angry scenes, just an immediate end to our relationship. I had to admit that I had grown to care for her. It saddened me, and I knew I would miss her. But as I had already decided, what I wanted and what she apparently wanted were two different things. The next day, Sunday, I just went about my usual weekend business. Washed the car, did the laundry, went for a run. What I didn't do was contact Mia. In the middle of the afternoon, I got a text. How was the game? I didn't reply. In the evening, another one came. What are you doing? Do you want to go out to dinner? Again, I didn't respond. I went to bed, still saddened but determined. On Monday at work, she called my cell phone. I left the phone on voicemail. Monday evening after work and a run before dinner, I was home, with a late-night soccer game going on in my apartment. I heard a knock on the door. I guessed who it might be, and for a moment I thought about just not answering it. But then I thought that this meeting would happen someday. Maybe it's best to get it over with. I said to myself, don't get angry, stay calm. I opened the door. Hi, she said when I opened the door. Where have you been? She asked with a wide, happy smile on her face. She moved to hug me. My response was not what she expected. I patted her back woodenly. No enthusiasm at all. And she stopped and looked at me with a confused expression. I had always been affectionate with her. She could tell something was different. How are you doing? She asked, studying my face still perplexed at the change in my attitude. I replied that I was fine, but without elaborating. Why didn't you call me? She asked. Didn't you get my messages? I replied that I hadn't had a chance. It was obvious she wasn't buying it. Are you mad about something? She asked. I took a deep breath and sat down on a kitchen chair. Look, Mia, I began. I think you and I want different things from this. I paused. Relationship. It's been fun and nice for us to get to know you better but I think we're two different people. She studied my face, her smile gone. She furrowed her eyebrows, trying to figure out what was going on. Are you breaking up with me? She asked. After everything we've done together, camping and fishing, that was only a week ago? We had a great time. What happened? I thought everything was going well. I realized she was getting worried. She just looked at me, not understanding. Finally, I started. I told her that I didn't like casual dating. I wanted us to have the potential for a long-term relationship. I told her that I knew we hadn't given each other any verbal commitment, but it wasn't fun for me to play the field. I agree, Patrick, she replied to me. I want it all too. I sat there looking at her with a slight smile on my face. My head was bobbing from side to side. What? she asked. I paused for a moment and then started to tell her about Saturday night. Tim and I went to soccer Saturday night, she nodded. We had a good time. The team won and everyone was in good spirits. I continued. We decided to go to a party. You were there? She interrupted, a look of bewilderment on her face. I told her how we had arrived and that I had hoped to see her. Then I told her that I was standing by the keg and overheard two guys talking about a girl who was coming down the stairs with some tall guy. I stopped and just looked at her. The ball was in her hands now. She was silent for a minute, digesting what I had said, putting it all together. The party, and the lack of a callback. Patrick, it's nothing. It was just Blake, the guy I went to St. Thomas with. I haven't seen him in a while. 
He's just a friend, she pleaded. I sat there looking at her. I was sure of what I was seeing. And then I asked her the key question. Did you have sex with him? I asked calmly. She hissed. What? What makes you say that? He's just an old high school friend I've been hanging out with. I stood up. Gently but firmly, I walked her to the door, putting my hand on her back. She continued to protest. Finally, outside on the porch, I told her I would think about it, turned around, walked into my apartment and closed the door. I didn't look back as she walked slowly to her car with tears in her eyes. Next part. I spent the next year and a half worrying about everything. Things were going well at work. I took the casebook they gave me and almost doubled it. To tell you the truth, it wasn't that hard. As far as I could tell, Larry was barely working part-time. It wasn't hard to improve on that figure. Another plus was that my friend, Tim Paris, was doing a great job managing my money. I was happy to see my investments growing at double-digit rates. I was thinking about buying a house. I could definitely afford a substantial down payment. But honestly, I was lonely. I wanted a woman in my life. I feared that if I bought a house and lived there alone, it might lead to more loneliness. Over the past year or so, I had dated several women. None of them lasted very long. The longest I dated was a woman named Hillary. Very nice, attractive, a little plain, but smart. She worked at a medium-sized accounting firm. We started dating and eventually got into it. It was probably about two months later, and I realized that something in our life together wasn't working. It sounds awful, but I was bored with her. Admittedly, there was nothing wrong with Hillary. Attractive, professional, smart, but I wasn't interested in her. I had an idea why, but for weeks I suppressed it. Finally, one night, face to face, I broke up with her. She was more surprised than saddened. She wanted to know why, and I couldn't give her any kind of satisfactory answer. She ended up getting angry with me. We can still be friends, I told her as she got up to leave, and her food was half finished. She never responded to my offer of friendship, turned and walked out of the restaurant. Later, alone with my thoughts, I discovered the suppressed reasons for my displeasure with Hillary. I compared her to Mia. Mia was fun to be with. On the other hand, I was sure Hillary would never cheat on me. These were the kind of rambling thoughts that visited me. Had Mia ruined me? Would no other woman ever compare to me? I hadn't seen Mia since the altercation in my apartment over a year ago. I'd heard from friends of friends that she was still at Stanhope. News of her always caught my attention, but I suppressed random thoughts of contacting her. But as fate would have it, our paths crossed. Tim and I were downtown for a fundraiser at the Roosevelt Hotel. There was a dinner, an auction, and a band for dancing. I sat at a table with several couples from the investment firm where Tim worked. After dinner, the band played and we chatted and enjoyed the evening. Suddenly, I received an elbow strike in the ribs from Tim. Incoming, 11 o'clock, he whispered to me. Unable to ignore it, I turned around and there was Mia. She was smiling and walking straight towards me. To be honest, she looked better than I remembered. I turned around, smiled at her and held out my hand for a shake. She ignored my hand and hugged me tightly with her whole body. Hello, stranger, she greeted me. For some awkward moment, we stood in silence, just looking at each other. And then Mia spoke quickly asking how I was doing, what was new in my life, etc. Soon we were already sitting at another table and chatting. It seemed like we were just picking up where we left off last time. Everything seemed so familiar and natural. And uh, there was no mention of what had happened at the party. We danced a few times and basically spent the last few hours of the evening together. We deepened our conversation as we sat at our table. The group had already packed up and left, when suddenly the lights in the ballroom came on. It was time to leave but none of us wanted the evening to end. Finally, we stood up. Mia gave me another hug, kissed my cheek, turned and headed for the exit. Halfway out, she stopped and turned around. Call me, she said, and I nodded. For the next few days, I mentally tugged at the rope. On the one hand, I'd had such a great time with Mia at the auction. It was definitely the best night I'd had in months. On the other hand, I didn't trust her. Did I want to open myself up to a relationship I didn't believe in? That was my struggle. Finally, after two days, I gave up and called her. I promised myself to have fun, to enjoy being with her, but to be careful. We started seeing each other again and again. It felt familiar and comfortable. Mia also seemed to change. Less wild, more stable, more mature. I realized this after the third time we were together. She was just as fun as I remembered. I was unfairly comparing her to Hillary. No comparison at all. 
About a month or so after we started dating again, we went out to dinner. Suddenly, Mia adopted a serious expression on her face. Patrick, she began, I think we need to talk about something. Not realizing where this was going, I just nodded. I need to explain about Blake. Blake? For a moment, I didn't realize what she was talking about. Then suddenly I remembered. Blake from the party. The same Blake. This is going to be interesting, I thought. She told me a story. She went to a Catholic school in town. A lot of kids went there to get a supposedly better education. Mia went there because her grandmother was a confirmed Catholic. Mia received a Catholic upbringing. In high school, she was a little overweight. There was a group of kids who were kind of in. The most popular kids at St. Thomas High. They were Blake Langley, Taylor White, and Lisa Shea, Mia's roommate. Mia always felt a little out of place. But there was no doubt about it. Blake was the king. His family was wealthy and owned the car dealerships in town. Blake always drove a new car. He was a tall, handsome guy, confident and funny. Mia stuck to her Catholic upbringing. She got it into her head that sex should only be within marriage. Mia said that when she entered Stanhope as a freshman, she felt the oppressive weight of her upbringing lifted. I have to admit, she told me, I went a little feral in college. I realized this, and upon hearing those words, I couldn't suppress a fit of jealousy. I remained silent. When I got to college, another thing happened, she said. I started playing sports. I took an elective fitness class and I got hooked on it. It became an obsession for me. From 165 pounds, I went down to 135. Most people gain weight in college. I, on the other hand, lost it. Then, she says, she started getting even more attention from guys. Then she started talking about the party. She was happy that she had a good time and was surprised to run into Blake. She had only seen him a few times throughout her entire time in school. He was suddenly paying a lot of attention to her. She remembered that in high school, she had always hoped for attention from Blake. And now it was happening. It was like I was suddenly in a different time of my life, back in high school, where popularity was so important. And here I was with the most popular guy in the world. And I didn't have those hang-ups that I had in high school. One thing led to another, and... She paused. And then when I realized I'd lost you over some quick hookup with a guy I'd barely spoken to in years. She paused. It broke my heart. I can't tell you how many times I wanted to call you. But that day you were so cold to me. I was afraid. And you want to know the best part, she added. I found out a few weeks later that Blake was engaged to a girl he met in college back east. I really felt cheap. That's the whole story, she said. I learned my lesson and I've changed since then. I just nodded, absorbing the information. It was a plausible explanation. But with Mia, I was still going to take things slow and steady. We continued to see each other, usually all weekend and once or twice a week. I was definitely getting a more mature version of the Mia I appreciated, and at the same time, a wilder Mia behind closed doors. We've been together for almost three months since we reunited, and things have been good. I was increasingly suppressing thoughts of Mia and Blake having fun at the party. I still wasn't rushing things, but there was no longer any doubt that we had become a solid couple. We had a conversation about exclusivity, and we both agreed to it. The word love was sometimes spoken in whispers. And then everything changed. It was a Tuesday night. No big deal. We hadn't planned on going out that night. To my surprise, I heard a knock on the door. It was Mia. She had a strange look on her face. Not exactly desperate, but something like that. I'd never seen her have that expression before, so it meant something was serious. What's wrong? I asked. And that's when she told me. I remembered that night. We drank too much wine. The rest you can guess for yourself. I'm not going to trap you, she told me. But I'm having a baby. We both sat there. Suddenly, I had to make some big life decisions. I thought about what I wanted, what she wanted, and what might happen. We talked for a long time that evening without making a clear decision. I noticed a new change in Mia. I saw a new maturity. A little different from the fun-loving girl I had first met. To be honest, I liked the new version better. Later, alone, analyzing these new events in my life, I realized something. The only thing holding me back was thinking about Mia's past. She had definitely been wild during her college years. She told me that herself. And of course, the fun with Blake Langley that night. She explained that. Sort of. But it still bothered me. I thought I could hide it. But the memories were never completely erased. I've given it a lot of thought. I'll spare the reader a lot of thought about my decision but I decided that we should stay together for many reasons, 
including the welfare of the baby, my future child. The next few months went by like a whirlwind. We moved in together and then moved into a three-bedroom townhouse. Mia was planning the wedding. Her mom was helping her. She was supposed to be six months pregnant at the wedding, so she would show. The whole time leading up to the wedding and eventual birth was a crazy, exciting, nerve-wracking time. My whole life took a completely different turn, and in the end, I was happy about it. One note. The wedding was small. There was no time to plan an extravagant celebration. Mostly her family, my small family, and friends. Friends on both our sides, which I didn't realize until it was too late. Blake Langley was among them. When I heard this, I protested. Mia, I'm not inviting that guy to the wedding, I told her. This led to a big argument. In the end, her logic won out. Langley, Taylor White, Lisa Shea, now Lisa Markham, she married Mitch Markham, were all my high school friends. These are all my high school friends. I can't invite everyone else and leave Blake out. She took a breath and continued. Plus, he'll be with his wife, Bree. I didn't know he was married. I reluctantly agreed. We did the wedding and everything was fine. I actually met Blake Langley. He was on top of things, and I had to admit that I liked the guy. I didn't trust him, but I liked him. And his wife, Bree, was just beautiful. Tall, taller than Mia, long blonde hair and a very slender body. In a whirlwind, when the wedding was over, we were suddenly parents. Mia had a baby boy, whom we named Michael. Life changed for us. Everything had to be planned. Spontaneity was a thing of the past, but it was good. I loved being a father. Matt and Mia surprised me with what a good mother she had become. I talked about how Mia had matured over the years. No longer a crazy college girl, but a beautiful mature mother who seemed even more attractive to me than her younger version. A few things changed for us new parents. One of those changes was Mia quitting her job at an advertising firm. She became a full-time mom, but she still made time to work out, and soon her post-pregnancy body was as firm and trim as it had ever been. About a year after Michael was born, I came home for a candlelight dinner. Mia informed me that Michael had already gone to bed for the night. I began to guess what the occasion was. I have a surprise for you, she announced with a smile on her face. The surprise was that Mia was pregnant again. We had discussed it, and we both agreed that we wanted another baby. I just didn't realize it would happen so quickly. I think we better start looking for a house, I announced. We talked about it, but were too busy to do anything. The townhouse we were renting had three bedrooms, so we weren't short on space. But we still wanted a house of our own, and decided to start looking as soon as the baby was born. A few months later, we got some new news. Mia was pregnant with twins. Suddenly, the question of whether we should have two or three children was solved. Our future home now had to accommodate five. Mia gave birth to twin girls. We named them Cleo and Claire. I know, a little cute, but that's what we wanted, and that's exactly what our two precious girls became. We found a big, dilapidated two-story house outside of town and bought it. It's hard to call it our dream home, but it suited our immediate needs. For the next few years, our life was good. Stressful with three kids, but at the same time quite rewarding, full of happiness and domesticity. My work was going well. I started brokering non-traditional building materials, and even when there was a downturn in the conventional markets, I had alternative products to sell. Financially, we were doing well. We found a woman who came three days a week for a few hours, and that allowed Mia to run errands, shop for groceries, and go to the gym. The kids grew to love Estrelita, and she became part of our family. Guess what? Mia asked one evening after I got home from work. My 10-year high school reunion is coming up this summer, she said, waving a printed invitation. She said she really wanted to go. We could stay with her mom and grandmother in town. We would take the kids with us and make a mini vacation out of the event. Her mom and grandma could spend time with the kids while we would go to various reunion events. I agreed, but deep down, I was nowhere near as excited about the reunion. I had met some of her friends, and they were all pretty nice, but I assumed Blake Langley would be there. What bothered me was not only the fact that he had entertained my wife, then a girl years ago, but that as far as I knew the guy had an exorbitant ego. As it turned out, there was a schedule for the reunion, a casual get-together at a neighborhood bar on Friday night. Saturday, a formal reunion at the Davenport Hotel downtown, and on Sunday, a family picnic at Laurelwood Park. Soon, we were already driving two hours to Mia's mom's house in town, where we stayed for the weekend. The next day, we gathered at the Marshfield Pub. Immediately after we arrived, Mia rushed over to a group of girls, including Lisa and a few others I recognized. 
They were her good high school friends. I moved to the outer perimeter of the crowd. I saw Langley, Taylor White, Mitch Markham, and a few other guys. Even at a high school reunion, high school factions were formed. I sipped my beer and quietly watched the socializing. From across the room, I could hear Langley talking. He was one of those guys who naturally talks loud. I wasn't even close to him, and I could hear almost everything he was saying. I noticed that he and his companions were looking in the direction of the girls and lowering their voices. I thought I heard them even mention Mia's name. I watched them look at Mia and the girls. Langley whispered something to the group and they all burst into laughter. I guess the gist of his comment. I shifted my gaze to the guys and suddenly recognized someone familiar. It was Teresa Paris, my friend Tim's sister. I walked over to her. Teresa, hi, I began to introduce myself. Patrick Price, your brother Tim's friend, I said. She looked at me for a moment and then smiled. Patrick, of course. I remember you, she said. I was glad to see a familiar face at this event. Patrick, Teresa began. This is my husband, Ryan O'Malley. We shook hands and smiled. Ryan was slim, with glasses, conservatively dressed and pleasant to look at. Not at all like the Langley frat boy and others. I learned that Ryan had attended the University of St. Thomas and that he and Teresa now lived in the city, in the Garlington neighborhood. I told them that I was married to Mia, Mia Durant. Ryan told me he knew her in high school, but I got the feeling he hadn't socialized with the same people. Like a lifeline, I clung to Teresa and Ryan, eagerly comparing the college experience and afterward. I learned that Ryan is a civil engineer and Teresa teaches high school health. Eventually, they left, and I turned around to check on Mia and see how long we would have to stay here. I saw that her group of friends had teamed up with Langley and the guys. I felt a pang of jealousy as I noticed Mia standing next to Langley. I walked over and wedged myself between Langley and Mia and asked her how she was doing. I surprised her, but then she kissed me on the cheek. She reintroduced me to some of her friends and everyone seemed nice. Langley behaved very nicely, asking me about the kids, work, and other superficial topics. I have to admit, he was charming, but there was something about him that I didn't trust. Later, as we drove home, Mia talked about how much she missed her high school friends. I told her about meeting Teresa and her husband. I asked Mia where Bree, Langley's beautiful wife, was. They're not together anymore. That was all she said. The next night was the most formal of the reunion series. Mia wore a low-cut dress showing off her cleavage. She looked really good. On the way to the hotel, I announced that I would be the designated driver. At the event, I sipped a light beer while Mia and all her friends drank cocktails. I noticed Langley, White, Markham, and the same gang of guys from last night all drinking and laughing together. I walked over to them. We chatted, and I gathered a little more information about them. Langley's family owned the local Toyota dealership in town, and he himself was the general manager. It turned out that Mitch Markham was the sales manager there and worked for Langley. Taylor White was an attorney, and Langley Motors was one of his clients. Langley and White lived in Garlington Heights, not far from where Teresa and Ryan O'Malley lived. I ended up leaving after a surprisingly decent conversation with these guys. They all seemed like people I would have befriended under other circumstances. However, and I couldn't pinpoint exactly why, I didn't trust Blake Langley. Most likely because I knew he had entertained my wife those years before. No matter how hard I tried, I still couldn't get it out of my head. Later, there was a dance. Mia and I danced a few songs and I realized she was on the verge of drinking too much. She danced with a few guys, including Langley. Without giving any sign, I kept my eyes on them as they danced. I didn't notice any inappropriate behavior. Later, as I drove home, I thought that perhaps my wariness of Mia's high school friends was unwarranted. For the most part, they seemed like decent people, and any negative feelings about them were misplaced. Yes, Langley was egotistical and a little boastful. But is that such a bad thing? The next day we had a picnic in the park. The weather was nice. I would estimate that about half the people there had young children, as we did. Michael had just turned three, and the twins, Claire and Cleo, were 14 months old and trying to master the art of walking. There was plenty of entertainment. A few of the boys played soccer and someone was trying to organize a volleyball match. With three small children, my activities were centered on them. Sam, Mia and I were trying to feed the kids peanut butter and jelly sandwiches when Langley and Lisa came up to us. Pat, we need a body for volleyball. Are you up for it? Asked Langley. I loved volleyball. I'd played in a city league in Stanhope before Michael was born. Thanks, I told him. I've got enough to do. And turned to my kids. 
Lisa cut in and said she'd help Mia with the kids, and I'd go play. I hesitated for a moment and then joined the game. I saw that they had drafted Ryan O'Malley and a few others. About half of the players knew how to play, and the other half knew about as much as you know in gym class. It was fun at first, but pretty quickly the guys on the other side, including Langley and Markham, became rivals. Both of these guys were over six feet tall and athletically built. They started throwing balls. Obviously, my team was losing if they were keeping score at all. At one point, I saw someone set up Langley for another hit. Like I said, I was already playing volleyball. Just as he went to serve, I jumped right out to my side of the net with my arms outstretched straight and upright. I blocked the shot, and it ricocheted off Langley's head. My team cheered, and for a moment I saw a look of anger flash across Langley's face. But just as quickly it disappeared, and a smile appeared on his face. Nice block, Pat, he addressed me. After that, the level of play on the other side increased. More spikes and light thrashing appeared. It was no longer a friendly, carefree game. It became serious. On one play, Langley threw the ball right in Ryan O'Malley's face. It looked deliberate. Ryan's glasses came off, and I saw him put his hand up to his face. He seemed to be in pain. I picked up his glasses and told the group I was done. They all urged me to continue, but I ignored them, and Ryan and I walked back to where Teresa was sitting. Ryan never made any negative comments or complained about the jab in the face, but it must have hurt. At first, with the kids buckled in the car, Mia was in a good mood, happy to talk about her friends as we drove away from town and home to Stanhope. About halfway home, she stopped talking. Hey, what's wrong? I asked. Are you doing okay? She didn't answer me at first, silently staring out the window. By now, I knew the right strategy. Stay silent and wait for her to answer. Finally, she answered. I miss my friends. She said. I also miss my mom and grandma. She added. She went on to talk about how her mom and grandmother loved spending time with her children and how it helped her. I always envisioned my children growing up with my family and friends, she said. Things are good in Stanhope, but I miss the city. I thought for a few minutes. I really didn't need to be in geographic proximity to the office. I could easily drive to our periodic sales meetings. Even Tim Paris had left Stanhope and was living in the suburbs outside the city. There wasn't much keeping us in Stanhope. I began to consider moving. Next part. Our house in Stanhope sold quickly, and we made a substantial profit. We ended up buying a house in a nice neighborhood in Garlington, around the corner from Teresa and Ryan O'Malley. We became friends with them, but they were more my friends than Mia's friends. We were also close to her mom and grandmother. That was convenient, too. Mia saw her friends often, but motherhood of three young children took up most of our time. It gave me great pleasure to see what a wonderful mother Mia was. Thinking back to those early days when she loved to party and have fun, I can't come to any other conclusion than that she had definitely grown up. The craziness showed from time to time, but not very often. We had a good life in town. It didn't matter to my business where I lived. The house we bought was a good-sized house with four bedrooms and three baths. The house had an unfinished basement, and I set up an office for myself there. Over the next year, we settled into the house and the lifestyle of living in the city. I loved spending time with the kids, and Mia, as I mentioned, was a wonderful mother. Socially, we spent time with her old company from St. Thomas. We also hung out with Ryan and Teresa O'Malley, and occasionally with my old college friend Tim Paris, Teresa's brother. All in all, at that point our relationship was great, our kids were doing well in school, and financially we were more than well off. We loved our house and our neighborhood, and we were pretty close to Mia's mom's house. So what could have gone wrong? This Friday, we had a sales meeting in Stanhope. I wandered around the office a bit and got home around lunchtime. When I got home, the usual happy chaos began as I sat the kids in their high chairs, put bibs on them, and prepared for the onslaught of spilled drinks, dropped dishes, and food strewn across the kitchen table. I have something interesting to tell you. Mia smiled and told me. What? I asked. Later, she told me. Finally, after all the children had been fed, bathed, dressed in their pajamas, put to bed, and had stories read to them. I went downstairs and saw Mia looking at her iPad in the dining room. So what's going on? I asked. Oh, Patrick, she began. I've had an amazing opportunity come up. I talked to my mom and I think it's going to work out. I remained silent, letting the conversation take its course. Eventually, I realized that all the important points would come up. I was at the park with the kids and met Lisa and her girls there. She began. 
We stopped by her house and Mitch was home during lunch. He was in a bad mood. She went on to say that Mitch's job as head of sales and marketing at Langley Motors was stressful and overwhelming. He said he needed a part-time marketing assistant, someone who would work 20 hours each week. At this point, she interrupted her story and looked at me, smiling. I was a little puzzled at first. What does Mitch Markham's marketing assistant have to do with... And then it got to me. You? I asked. And she nodded, still smiling. How the hell are you going to work 20 hours a week? I exclaimed. She then explained to me the convoluted plan, whereby her mother would come here on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and Mitch said the hours were flexible, and she could work from home if necessary. I didn't like this plan for several reasons. We didn't need the money, and for that matter, it would create more stress for me. I protested quietly. I tried to poke holes in her plan, but she had thought it through and found the answers. I protested that we didn't need the money. Patrick, this isn't about money. I have a college degree and I want to use it. I love kids, but sometimes I want to socialize with other adults. I really want that, she added. I mean, I still have to interview, she told me. But Mitch has already asked how soon I can start. I wondered. My biggest worry was about the kids. They were still small, and as I'd said before, Mia was an excellent mother. The secondary concern was, selfishly, myself. It was hard enough for me to combine my job with working from home. And now that she was working, and my mother-in-law was with the kids most of the time, I imagined I would be interrupted more and more often. Eventually, I gave in, declaring, let's give it a try. As expected, Mia got the job. The first few weeks were a challenge to figure out the car business and be separated from the kids. Mia was with them 24-7 for their entire lives. Eventually, we got into a rhythm. Her mom was good with the kids on the days that Mia worked, and all my concerns about productivity disappeared. Mia's mood also improved as she better understood her role in the business. She became happier and more confident. Taking a break from childcare a few days a week did have a more positive impact. At first, it was every few weeks. I almost didn't pay attention to it. But suddenly, I realized that her part-time job was starting to feel like a full-time job. At some point, we started discussing it, and it turned into an argument. She later apologized and said she would talk to Mitch about her work schedule. A few weeks later, we were invited to a party at Blake Langley's house in Garlington Heights. Blake was there with an attractive young woman I hadn't met before. Mitch, Taylor, and a few others were there with their wives. Blake, as befits the master of the house, really charmed me. Like I said, he really can be fun to be with, and I had a full complement of fun. Mia is doing a great job in the marketing department. The business is growing, and I have to say that Mia's great job is contributing to that, he told me. There were a total of about 20 people at the party. The weather was nice, and we all gathered in the backyard around the pool. I drank two light beers all evening, knowing that I would have to drive the short distance home afterward. I was talking to a group of guys about the upcoming Stanhope soccer season and lost track of time. It was getting dark, and in the midst of the conversation, I looked up to check where Mia was. I looked around the backyard. I saw Lisa. Mia was usually next to her. Mia wasn't. Then I wondered where Langley was. I looked around. There was no sign of him either. Maybe I'm overreacting. To calm myself down, I decided to look around. Calmly but firmly, I stepped away from the sports talk. I approached the sliding doors leading into the house. There was no one in the kitchen. I walked down the hallway to the bathroom. She looked busy. And I rounded the corner of the living room and saw the stairs leading to the second level. By this time, I was getting anxious. Memories of that party years ago flashed through my mind, of Langley and Mia coming down from upstairs. I was about to go down the stairs when I heard a voice from the hallway. It was Langley. Pat, he began. Looking for the bathroom? He asked. In the dark hallway behind him, I noticed movement. I immediately headed toward it. What were the two of them doing in a dark part of the house? Suddenly, I realized that Olivia, his young girlfriend, was with him. Suddenly, I felt very stupid. Yes, I squeezed out. I was looking for the bathroom, I lied. Langley looked at me strangely. I almost made a fool of myself. He had undoubtedly noticed my strange behavior. He led me to the upstairs bathroom, still being a charming host. After I sheepishly went to the bathroom, I returned to the party and saw Mia with Lisa, Mitch, and a small cluster of people. Everyone looked normal. I cursed to myself. Ever since we'd gotten married, she'd never once given me a reason to doubt her. Memories of her and Langley popped into my brain over and over again. Just let it go, I told myself. Later, driving the short distance home, 
Mia was calm. Usually she was upbeat and happy, having spent time with friends. Today, she was different. Also, when I offered to make love to her, she firmly refused. Usually after a few drinks, Mia, she agrees. That's what I expected. But it didn't happen tonight. Two days later, I received a text from Ryan O'Malley asking me to stop by his place one night this week. I've become good friends with Ryan and Teresa, with Mia to a lesser extent. Every once in a while we would hang out with them, but much more often it was just Ryan and I, or even Ryan, Teresa, and me. Thursday night I stopped by their place, and after all the celebratory handshakes and hugs, we went out on the back patio. Teresa asked if I wanted a beer or something, and I told her, no thanks. You might need one pat, Ryan stated seriously. Teresa came back with three bottles of beer. What's the matter? I asked. They paused, and there was an awkward silence. I saw tears appear in Teresa's eyes. We had some bad news last week. Ryan began. Cancer. Pancreatic cancer. Very scary looking. Ryan told me the whole story. He was in pain. He thought it would go away. But it wouldn't go away. Finally, he got to a doctor's appointment. Pretty quickly, they did more tests and started working with an oncologist. The prognosis. They say it could be a year. His voice shook with excitement as he said this. Here's the thing, he told me. We don't want a bunch of people to know about this. We're only going to tell family and a few close friends. I know you need to tell Mia, but I don't want it to get out of line. I sat stunned for a moment, trying to digest this terrible news. What? I began. What can I do? I asked. Just be a good friend. Drop by when you can, Ryan said. And when, well then, be a friend to Teresa. He looked at her, tears streaming down her cheeks. Pat, you're one of the only real friends I trust. Teresa and I just wanted you to know, he told me. Later, walking home, I shed tears myself thinking about what they had said to me. I knew I had to hold myself together to support Ryan and Teresa. Life went on, and I spent time with Ryan and Teresa whenever I could. Mia traveled with me a few times, but she seemed to find excuses to avoid those visits. She told me that it was hard for her to think about death. When I told her it was hard for everyone, she didn't respond. As I think back on this time in our lives, I realize that our relationship began to change, very subtly at first, but looking back, we started to drift apart in different directions. I spent a lot of time with Ryan, sometimes with Teresa too. Most of my emotional energy was directed towards my good friends. I didn't realize it at the time, but less and less energy was going into my marriage. At the same time, Mia began to work more at Langley Motors. Of course, we continued to function as a family, and with three young children, including twins, there was always something to do, so in many ways the change between us went unnoticed. First things first. As I explained, I had jealousy. I know it seems a bit frivolous, but the scene from years ago at the party, when Mia came down the stairs with Langley with a freshly satisfied look on her face, continued to flicker through my thoughts periodically. You may ask, why did you marry her if you don't trust her completely? My answer is this. If she hadn't been pregnant, it's unlikely we would have gotten married at all. And I have to admit a few things. First, she's a great mom and has been a good wife for most of our marriage. And she never gave me any real reason to be suspicious. Finally, we always seem to have a strong emotional connection. Things started to change. Again, due to work, kids, and Ryan and Teresa's support, I was busy. Mia was working much more than the original 20 hours a week. With the help of her mother and grandmother, the household was mostly under control. But the emotional connection was strained. The first detail fell into place a few weeks later. I stopped by to visit Ryan. We played chess together. He was much better than me, but it was an enjoyable pastime. Teresa came home an hour or so after I arrived. We chatted about the usual things. I saw Mia downtown last night, she told me. Downtown? She'd gotten home after dinner, but I thought she'd said she was working late. My curiosity peaked. Where did you see her? I asked quietly. Teresa said she was near Clancy Street, in the neighborhood of restaurants, bars, and boutiques. Oh, really? I replied, keeping my composure. Who was she with? Teresa looked at me sharply. Ryan, with his pawn raised, froze mid-move and studied me as well. Uh, Teresa stammered. I couldn't say. I was driving down Clancy and I saw her. She's so pretty, it's hard not to notice her. Is everything okay, Pat? Asked Ryan. I tried to assure them that everything was fine, but I think they understood my outward demeanor. A little while later I left, walking the short distance to the house. On the way, 
I tried to think of a way to ask about her on Clancy Street while feeding the kids. She didn't say anything about going anywhere. In the evening, when all the kids were tucked in, I asked her what she was doing at work. She replied that they had a big sales event coming up, and that's why she was staying late at work. Santa, I asked if she would have to meet with the media from the local radio and TV stations. She replied that no, it's all done online. I rarely leave my cubicle, she told me. Who approves the ad campaign? I asked. First Mitch and then Ryan. She replied, but then looked at me. What's with all the questions all of a sudden? She asked. I replied that I was just curious. She studied me, not believing my newfound curiosity. She suddenly stopped talking and went to bed. I sat in the kitchen and thought, it wasn't hard to come to this conclusion. I knew for sure that my wife had just lied to me. I just wasn't sure why. Over the next week or so, she came home early, took care of the kids, and seemed to be trying to communicate better with me. If it weren't for my suspicions, it would have been a happy time for the family. The next week she worked late on Monday, coming home after the kids went to bed. Then two days later I got a text from her. Need to work late, mom doesn't mind helping with dinner for the kids. As the kids were finishing eating, I told my mother-in-law that I had an errand to run. She happily stayed with the kids. As I drove past the car dealership, I looked for her black Highlander. I knew the employees parked on the north side of the building. The parking lot could be seen from the road. As I drove by, I noticed there were no cars in the parking lot. I knew that Langley drove a Lexus SUV. There was no Lexus, much less a black Highlander. I checked my watch. 7.36 p.m. I turned around and drove home, hoping and praying that Mia was there and our paths just hadn't crossed. Unfortunately, they didn't. She arrived at a quarter to nine. Her late nights were getting later and later. The kids had already gone to bed for the night. She had missed it. Where have you been? I asked. Where do you think I've been? She replied, a note of irritation in her voice. Were you at work? I began. In your office? Of course I was. Where else would I be? Her attitude was becoming more and more negative. I sat on the couch and digested lie number two. I barely noticed her leave. I sat like that for almost an hour, wondering what to do. All signs pointed to her doing something she didn't want me to know about, most likely with Langley. The next day, Mia came home at the usual time. She was happy and in a good mood. This was a rare occurrence, and despite my suspicions, the evening turned out to be pleasant, just like old times. A fun dinner with the kids, followed by bathing, pajamas, brushing teeth, and reading. Their ritual before bedtime. It was always more enjoyable when we were both involved. Later, coming down from the bedroom, I found Mia in the living room with a glass of white wine. She was still in a good mood. We've been invited to Blake's family cabin on Baltus Lake this Saturday, and so are the kids, she told me. I didn't say anything back, digesting the information. Mitch and Lisa, Taylor and some others will be there, she added. The weather promises to be nice. It's going to be fun. I paused for a moment before answering. I didn't really feel like going with this crowd but I really wanted to know what was going on with Mia and Langley, or not. I agreed to go and said I thought it would be fun. The next night, Thursday, I stopped by Ryan and Teresa's house. As I mentioned, they lived around the corner, a block and a half away from us. I hated to see it, but there was no doubt that Ryan was getting noticeably worse. He looked gaunt, and his skin had taken on an unnatural color. He spent some time going over the latest medical information they had gotten. Unfortunately, there was nothing that could be seen as positive. Nevertheless, both Ryan and Teresa kept their spirits high, and I admired them for it. What's going on with you? Ryan asked me. Is everything okay? He looked at me with a concerned expression on his face. I felt bad. My friend had a terminal illness, and my own personal problems were putting me in a bad mood. It's no big deal, I told them, trying to put myself in a positive frame of mind. Hey, buddy, we're your friends. What's going on? I sat like that for a minute and then told them about my suspicions about Mia and Langley. I wondered about that after I saw her downtown a few weeks ago. I didn't see Blake there, but I had a feeling she was on some kind of date, said Teresa. I told them that she had lied to me about that night. I told them about the strange hours. And finally, I admitted that I had no proof, but I felt our marriage was falling apart. As I left, they promised me their friendship and offered any help I might need. Keep your eyes and ears open at the lake this weekend, Ryan suggested. Saturday turned out to be a beautiful Saturday, and we were on the road before nine in the morning. It was about an hour drive to the lake. A few people stayed the night, but it was thankfully out of our reach with three kids. 
The house was an old log cabin that had been modernized and added to. There was a dock, boat, and jet skis. One section of the lake had a small sandy beach for the kids to play on. Mia and a few other moms spread out on the small beach. The kids were splashing around in the shallow water. The women chatted and I stepped aside. I wandered around the grounds, talked to some of the others, and grabbed a beer. I noticed Langley, Mitch, Taylor, and a few others huddled together. Every now and then I could hear Langley's loud, murmuring voice. I saw beautiful Olivia, Langley's girlfriend, chatting with everyone. It made me feel a little better. After a while, Mia asked if I would watch the kids for a while, and I agreed. I watched her, pregnant Lisa and their friends socializing outside the house. I focused on the kids, making sure they didn't go too deep into the water. Every now and then, a jet ski would whiz past us. The kids were fascinated by the shiny water vehicles and the loud noises they made. Man, it must have been half an hour when I looked up and saw Mia's group gathered together. I saw Lisa and a few others, but I didn't see Mia. Keeping my eyes on the kids in the water, I looked around the area periodically, trying to find her. But I didn't. I was about to pull the kids onto dry land to examine them more closely when I suddenly heard Langley. I peeked behind one of the big evergreen trees and saw him hugging his girlfriend Olivia on the far shore near the dock in a cluster of people. Maybe there really was no reason to worry, I hoped. A little while later, Mia showed up. I can take over now, she sighed, turning to me. She looked almost normal. But something wasn't right, and I studied her, trying to figure out what was wrong. What? she began. Why are you looking at me? I'm going to watch the kids now. Go have fun. I wanted to unwind a little, so I decided to take a walk along the west side of the lake. I had noticed a few paths in that direction when we first arrived. See, I walked through the woods and came across a fork in the trail. I went inland and continued along the narrow trail, reflecting on my life. I was taking stock. I had a good job that paid well, and I was doing well. I loved my children, and despite my recent doubts, I loved Mia too. Mia was a great mother, and we lived in a good neighborhood. The inconsistencies, which I guess you could call inconsistencies, in her whereabouts on those few occasions might have had a perfectly good reason. Buoyed by optimistic thoughts, I decided to head back to the party. I was walking back down the inner trail and suddenly heard people talking. They seemed to be at the other end of the trail, the one closer to the lake. I stopped parallel to whoever was talking, obscured by a thicket of deciduous trees. No doubt I heard Langley's loud voice and realized he was probably with his buddies. That's why we close early on Wednesdays, I heard Langley laugh. To get some of that eagle on the table. Muffled sounds drowned out some of the comments. To see it on the table. Unintelligible comments and laughter again. I look forward to it all day every Wednesday. I can't wait to lock. At that moment, a pair of jet skis swept across the lake, and for a few moments I couldn't hear anything that was being said. A short, inaudible conversation broke out. And then I heard someone say, As a lawyer at the firm, I must remind you of the anti-fraternization policy, Taylor said seriously, addressing what I understood to be Langley. At that moment, another jet ski flew past, obscuring some of what was said. But through the noise came a phrase I thought I heard from the muffled conversation. Besides, Pat's a good guy, so... More noise came from across the lake, but I made out the last phrase. His wife. At that moment, all three jet skis roared past. I didn't hear anything else that I could make out through the noise. It sounded like the guys were coming back, their voices growing quieter and quieter as I sat hunched behind a clump of trees. I sat and pondered. Although I couldn't hear everything that was being said, it was pretty obvious what was going on. Langley entertained Mia at least every Wednesday night, apparently at his workplace after the dealership closed early, and then he bragged about it to his buddies. Taylor, the company lawyer, warned Langley of the possible consequences. And apparently, he had some sympathy for me. The high spirits I'd built up just a few minutes ago deflated like a burst balloon. My suspicions were confirmed. Now I had to decide on a strategy. First of all, and it wouldn't be easy, but I knew it was the right move. I needed to continue to act normal, not angry or suspicious. Next, I would need to contact a lawyer. Methodically, I began to mentally retrace my steps and separate our lives. For the rest of the day, I focused on two things. Spending time with the kids and avoiding Mia and Langley. All the way home, I did my best to stay calm and maintain a neutral attitude. Every once in a while, I would notice my thoughts drifting away from what I had heard and speed up. Patrick, slow down, said Mia. <laughs> Luckily, everyone was exhausted from the day at the lake and went to bed early. 
I spent the rest of the weekend doing the usual chores that all homeowners have. As much as possible, I avoided Mia. I feared my facade would crumble, and I wasn't ready to confront her. And yet, since I was working from home, in my basement office, I needed to think through my next steps outside the house. I knew I needed a lawyer, but I didn't know of any. I called Tim Paris, my friend and financial advisor, and Ryan. I asked for their opinion, explaining the situation, and sworn to secrecy. Is it okay if I share this sad news with Teresa? asked Ryan. I told him, of course, but no one else. <laughs> By the end of the week, I had found someone with a good reputation. Friday afternoon at 3 o'clock, I was in Myron Overby's office. I studied the man. He seemed well-mannered and soft-spoken. Several times I had to ask him to speak louder. As we talked, I became more and more concerned. I was hoping I was going to get caught by some vicious shark. This guy looked like a rosy-cheeked librarian with a soft-spoken and not-too-imposing appearance in his suit and neat bow tie. Do you have any questions for me? Asked Myron. I hesitated. I wasn't sure about this guy. I knew it would probably be a battle with Mia, but I wasn't sure Myron was exactly the person I wanted beside me in the trench. Noticing my hesitation, Myron spoke up. Mr. Price, he began. I've noticed some reluctance on your part. I understand. My manners are polite and well thought out, I know, he added. But please don't take my appearance as a weakness. My clients always remain at an advantage. Always. I assure you. The last few phrases were spoken with icy calm. I'd seen others underestimate Myron and calculate their strategies. And I was immediately convinced how competent and effective he could be. Mr. Overby, I said, standing up and extending my hand across the table. I have no doubts. I said this as we shook hands. Myron gave me a list of the information I needed. We talked some more. Finally, he asked me a specific question. Have you asked your wife about your reasonable suspicions? Not really, I answered. Whenever I questioned her late at night or at off hours, she would get angry. And until I overheard those guys talking at the lake, I didn't think she'd betray me like that. I mean, other than that, she was a good wife and a wonderful mother. I sighed shudderingly, finding myself on the verge of tears. The reality of the situation came over me. My life was about to change forever. Is it possible for you to forgive her? Asked Myron. I sat for a while and thought about it. I really thought there was a chance I could eventually forgive her. I told Myron, but I'll never trust her again, I told him. Myron looked at me and nodded, interlocking his fingers. Then he told me how he thought it was going to go. Stopping, he looked at me and asked one last question. Is it possible to get any physical evidence? Anything? A text message or a picture? Myron asked. Anything with evidence would be leverage for us. I sat back and thought. After a few minutes, I told him I had an idea. As we parted, we agreed to meet the following week. In the meantime, I started working on a plan to extract evidence. That week, I already had an evidence plan ready to go. I knew that the car dealership closed early on Wednesday. I parked my car at a grocery store two blocks away and walked to Langley Motors. Around four o'clock, I stopped by there to surprise Mia. I told her I was in the neighborhood. After a quick visit when no one was looking, I slipped into the restroom. I hid in a closed stall. No one came in to check. I waited. A little after six o'clock, I stepped out into the darkened car dealership. For a few minutes, I stood still and listened. At first, it seemed silent. Then a woman's laughter was heard in the back of the building. I couldn't tell who it was, but I remembered the conversation I had overheard at the lake. Quietly, I crept toward Langley's office. The noise outside the office door, still muffled, grew louder. It was clear from the sighs and groans what was going on behind the closed door. Phone in hand, camera at the ready, I quietly turned the knob on the unlocked office door. As I took the fourth picture, I realized I had made a huge mistake. She looked up and screamed. A moment passed and Langley saw me too. What the hell? He yelled. The partner, I discovered, wasn't Mia. It was his girlfriend, Olivia. She was yelling for me to get out and for him to get off of her. A jumble of thoughts ran through my head and I realized why he decided to close early on Wednesdays. What the hell are you doing here, Pat? Yelled Langley. I felt like turning and running away, but I knew that would create a much bigger problem later. I needed to explain everything and perhaps correct my unfortunate mistake. I apologized and said I had made a big mistake. Surprisingly, Langley wasn't as furious as he should have been. With Olivia behind closed doors in Langley's private restroom, I tried to explain. Last week at your lake house party, I overheard you talking to the others on the trail, I told him. He nodded, 
looking at me intently. It was hard to hear everything, but what I heard sounded like Mia was the one who was. I hesitated. On the table. At that moment, Olivia appeared, fully dressed. She sat down silently and listened to my explanation. I told them that I needed proof, and that's how we ended up in the position we were in now. I apologized to Olivia. She asked me for my phone. She flipped through the pictures and then showed one to Langley. I like this one, Olivia said good-naturedly. Mia is a wonderful person, attractive, and I've known her for a long time, but I'm not having an affair with her. He told me this with a strange expression on his face. You better not, added Olivia. A slight sense of relief dawned in me. They didn't seem particularly angry and even seemed to be enjoying some of my pictures. Can I ask you a favor? I said to them. I asked them if we could forget about all of this. I begged them not to tell anyone, especially Mia. I was already uncomfortable at this point. Pat, yes, we can keep quiet about all of this, Langley agreed. But on one condition, he told me. I nodded vigorously. I was willing to do almost anything for their silence. We'll keep the pictures, Langley smiled and said. Next part. As I walked the few blocks to my car, I experienced several feelings. The first was embarrassment at my jealous mistake. The second was relief that Langley and Olivia had been so reasonable about my gaffe. And finally, a huge sense of happiness that my wife wasn't having an affair. Apparently, I had completely misinterpreted what had been said at the lake. On the drive home, I vowed to be the best, most tolerant husband, not to worry or question her irregular schedule. She was doing what brought her fulfillment, and by the looks of it, she was pretty good at it. I was happy for Mia. I began the process of repairing the relationship I had damaged. I called my attorney, Myron Overby, and asked him to step aside. After a brief questioning, he agreed. Flowers, small gifts, backstrokes. I tried to show Mia how much I cared about her. I reflected on what a good mother she was, and I complimented her a lot more often to let her know how much I appreciated her. What's gotten into you? She said one day after I sent flowers to her office. I simply replied that I loved her and I loved our family. There was a general elation in our home that was passed on to the children. On days when we all had dinner together, the conversations were joyful and lively. One negative that conflicted with the renewed happiness I felt at home was Ryan's health. His condition had deteriorated and he often lacked the energy for regular chess games. He and Teresa were the only people I told about my suspicious mistake of catching Blake Langley entertaining his girlfriend on his office desk. Despite his waning health, Ryan laughed heartily at my mistake. It was one of our last happy moments together. Mia still stayed late sometimes, was inexplicably absent, and gave slightly illogical answers to some questions. I began to just accept and trust her, no matter how strange her explanations were. Life in our busy family flowed on, and Mia's mom became an invaluable part of our household. She looked after the children when needed as Mia's hours at Langley Motors increased to full time. Mia came home one evening and said she needed to be in Denver for a dealer conference in two weeks. It was a four-day trip, leaving on Sunday, returning on Thursday. Who's going with you? I asked, unable to suppress my curiosity. She said she was traveling alone, but there would be other marketing staff from around the country with her. Normally, I would have been wary and asked more questions, but I just mentally repeated the mantra. I trust her. On Sunday, I drove her to the airport, and she left on the morning flight to Denver at 10.40. She called me around 1.30 in the afternoon to let me know she had made it, and the flight went without incident. That week seemed particularly challenging for me with the kids. By Tuesday morning, I was on edge. Mia's mom saw my state of mind when she arrived that afternoon. Why don't you relax and have dinner with a friend or something? Just go out tonight and relax, she suggested. I'll bring the kids' grandmother. The two of us can handle them. I wondered. She was right. I needed a break. I took her up on her offer and made plans to meet Tim Paris, my good friend and financial advisor, downtown in the Fur District. It was a popular neighborhood with bars, restaurants, and trendy stores. We had a nice dinner, but afterward, Tim had to go home. He had a call from the East Coast office at 6 in the morning. I checked my watch. It wasn't even 7 o'clock yet. I walked across the street to Ballantino's, a bar we'd been to before, which I liked. It was crowded, and I found a seat at the bar, ordered a glass of wine, and relaxed. About 10 minutes later, halfway through the wine, I heard my name being called. Pat, what are you doing here? It was Lisa Markham, a good friend of Mia's who was married to Mitch. It was nice to see a familiar face. She was at Ballantino's with three other women at a table in the corner. I told her I had dinner with a friend, 
and was just having a nightcap. She said it was her bachelorette party, and they were waiting for their table at the restaurant. Where's me? She asked, using her shortened nickname. Set, I explained that she was away on business for a few nights. Oh yeah, I think she told me she had to go somewhere, said Lisa. What's Mitch doing? I asked. He's out of town too. I was going to go with him, but he said something came up and it wasn't going to work out. She told me. That's too bad, she said. Airport aside, I like Denver, she added. Suddenly, an icy chill ran down my back. Did she say Denver? That's exactly where Mia was. I had to stay calm, but I needed more information. Mitch was traveling alone, I asked carelessly. She replied that she had. When did he leave? I asked. Sunday, morning flight. Arrives early afternoon, returns Thursday. She told me and paused. Why all these questions? She asked suddenly. I brushed off her question as best I could and changed the subject. We chatted for a few more minutes, and then Lisa's friends informed her that their table was ready, and she left. My suspicions were high. What a coincidence to meet Lisa, I thought. She'd never once told me she was traveling with anyone. Certainly not with her boss, Mitch Markham. I decided to call her. I had a small hope that it might just be some kind of communication error. Maybe there was a logical explanation. I made the call. We chatted a bit first, and I told her that I had gone to dinner with Tim. What did you do for dinner? I asked. Just going to the room, she said. I asked if she had met anyone she knew. She replied that no, she was alone. I paused for a second and then got distracted rather quickly. Is it possible that Markham was in Denver for some separate purpose? Possible, but unlikely. Driving home from the Fur District, I devised a plan. I would need Mia's mom's help with the kids. I studied the various details and already had an idea of what my strategy would be. Next part. On the flight to Denver, I got the center seat. I was glad that at least one seat was available at the last minute. On the shuttle to the rental car lot, I re-evaluated my strategy. I would hole up in the lobby of the Marriott Denver Denver Downtown Hotel, where I learned she was staying. If she was really alone, my visit would just be a big happy surprise, and we'd stay in Denver for the weekend. If something else was going on with Markham, however, a different kind of confrontation awaited us. When I got to the Marriott, it was the middle of the afternoon. There wasn't much activity. I positioned myself in a shady alcove. I had a baseball cap and a newspaper. I felt a little ridiculous sitting there, but I knew I had to find out what was going on with Mia, if anything. I sat there and waited. Whenever someone came in, I looked up. Around five o'clock, the lobby became lively. Twenty minutes later, I saw Mia come in. She was alone and was walking across the hall to the elevator. In the elevator car, she was alone. There was a floor indicator above the door. I noted that the elevator stopped on the eighth floor. I checked my watch almost 5.30. I figured that if she was getting off, the earliest she could get off was 6.30 after all. This was my wife and I knew her habits. I waited. 6.30 turned into 7. But as far as I could tell, she was still upstairs in her room. I suddenly felt hopeful hoped that there was some logical explanation for all of this. I decided that if there was no activity before 7.30, I would call her and surprise her. At 7.31, I got up and smiled. I had indeed come to the wrong conclusion. I reaffirmed the promise I had made to myself to trust her. Said I strolled through the lobby without removing my ridiculous hat, heading for the elevator and the eighth floor. Suddenly I froze, then turned away from the elevator. I recognized the voice speaking loudly over the cell phone pressed to my ear. It was Markham. I stepped behind a large indoor plant. He was so focused on his phone conversation that he didn't notice me. Through the foliage, I saw him press the up button on the elevator. Another couple entered the elevator. I watched the floor indicator show stopping at the third floor. Then it stopped at the eighth floor. I retreated to the same alcove I'd been sitting in all day. I wanted to confront them. But by eight o'clock, they still hadn't shown up. It looked like they were staying home. It didn't take a genius to figure out what was going on. I just didn't know which room on the eighth floor they were in. I cast a glance at the store in the lobby. I improvised. I asked the clerk if they would deliver flowers to a guest. They replied that of course they would. I gave a name and asked if the flowers could be delivered quickly. They agreed, saying they were not busy. I gave the young attendant $20 to deliver the flowers as soon as possible. I then took the elevator to the eighth floor. There was a small seating area near the elevator that overlooked each hallway where the rooms were located. I waited. I saw a young clerk stop at a door at the end of the hallway. I counted. The fifth door on the right. 
There was a brief interaction and muffled conversation while the delivery was made. I moved down the opposite hallway as the clerk withdrew. I now knew the room number. 809. I took the elevator down to the main floor and used the phone in the lobby. I asked for the cleaning lady. Could you please send clean towels to room 809? I asked. I positioned myself again near the elevator on the eighth floor. This time, it took a little longer. I heard the elevator bell chime, announcing that it had stopped on the eighth floor. Then there was the rumble of a cleaning cart heading to 809. A brief knock, and then the maid called out, housekeeping. I silently found myself right behind the maid. I saw her hold out her key and swing the door open, holding towels in her hands. That was all I needed. I rushed past the surprised hotel clerk and saw Mitch Markham, who was peering into the room across the short hallway. Huh? He uttered, finally realizing who it was. Pat, who are you? He asked in surprise. What? exclaimed Mia, alarmed. She hadn't seen me yet. Markham moved toward me, holding out both hands, palms flat in a stopping gesture. My accumulated rage carried me toward him, and my right fist slammed into the soft flabbiness of his stomach. He collapsed to the floor in a sitting position. I stepped over him and saw Mia on the bed. I also noticed the flowers on the bedside table. Patrick, she exclaimed. I just stared at her, absorbing what was happening. Even after I called the housekeeping department, I still had a faint hope that I would barge in and see them fully clothed, looking over the sales charts. No, there was only one explanation for what had happened. It was obvious. And while I watched, Mia launched into a typical list of illogical excuses. It wasn't what I thought it would be. It was just the first time. It was just sex. She loves me. And so on. Despite my emotional rage, I remembered enough to pull out my phone and take pictures. Throwing one last glance at Mia, who was sobbing and begging for forgiveness, I turned to leave. Don't you dare, I began in a hissing whisper. Come back to my house. As I was leaving, I heard her sobbing reply, I'm sorry, where would I go? It's my house too. I said nothing. Next part. All the way home, I decided that I wasn't going to be the good guy. All the feelings about betrayal and lying came to the surface. I remembered how I'd felt years ago when I'd seen her and Langley together at that party. It was like that, only worse. Much worse. I had numerous texts and voicemails from her. On Myron's advice, I saved them all. We might need them, he told me. Once I arrived, I told her mom everything. She had become such an integral part of the family, helping with Michael and the twins, that I couldn't think of a way to explain Mia's absence. Besides, it felt good to humiliate Mia and put all the misery on her mother. Her mother was in shock. The next phone call was to Lisa Markham, Mia's good friend. She exploded with anger. I told him last time that if he does that again, it's over. Last time? Again? Obviously, this was unfamiliar territory for Markham. Needless to say, this was going to affect Mia and Lisa's long-term friendship. Okay, I thought. I know I'm being vindictive, but I couldn't help it. I was angry. And besides angry, I was hurt. Terribly hurt. Hurt for what she had done to me, and more importantly, for how it would affect the children. We were about to take them from a loving home, where their parents lived together, to a world of shared custody, less stability, compromised finances, and partial parenthood. Mia complied with my wishes and stayed away from the family home. At first, it was a Sunday. I took the kids on a little hike in the mountains. When we got home, everyone was tired and hungry. When we arrived, there was Mia sitting in the kitchen. The kids who kept asking, where's mommy, huddled around her, despite anything that might have happened. There was no denying that Mia was a good mother, and the kids missed her. As she interacted with the kids, hugging them and playing, I noticed her checking my facial expression, glancing at me quickly, trying to gauge the temperature of my emotions. I remained calm. Stone Buddha, face blank. Mia made a delicious dinner for the kids and me. There were moments when even for me it seemed normal, but there was no way around the dark cloud of dishonesty and betrayal, invisible to the children that hung over our family. For the rest of the evening, Michael and the twins got ready for bed. In our family, this was not a long process. Bathing, pajamas, stories, and finally sleep. I sat in the living room with the TV off, waiting for the confrontation I had avoided so far. I knew the time had come. Mia entered the living room silently, sitting down on the edge of the only chair across from me on the couch. At first, she studied my face in silence. Finally, taking a deep breath, she began to apologize. I owe you an explanation. 
Finally, she said, My mom and grandmother got it into my head that sex is only for marriage. I had heard all of this before. I thought it was Langley's explanation. And then she talked about how she had a crush on Mitch in high school. And when they started working together, they became close. One thing led to another. And as she explained, they started sleeping together. But I'll never do that again. I'll agree to anything you want. Please, 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 Patrick, I'll even quit my job, she told me. Don't do that, I told her. No? She asked, looking confused. You'll need the money. Mia was silent. It seemed the practical consequences of her actions were beginning to dawn on her. This house, our lifestyle, plans for the children, all of that was likely to change. Patrick, I love you. Is there no desire in your heart to forgive me? Please, she pleaded. I'm not sure you realize what you've done. I told her and she tried to interrupt, but I mouthed off. I'm sorry. Maybe in time the kids and I will forgive you. I just can't trust you anymore. I told her. The kids? She asked. Why are you talking about children? I sat back and studied her, marveling at how an intelligent woman didn't understand what she was talking about. Mia, I said. It's not just my life you've ruined. It's the children's lives, too. She sat staring at me with a questioning expression. Joint custody, two separate homes, potential foster parents, screwed up finances. That's the world they're going to get because you entertained Mitch Markham, I told her. Her face crumbled. She was finally beginning to realize the full results of her actions. Through her tears, she begged for forgiveness. You loved me enough to marry me, she sobbed. Can't you find that love again now? Actually, Mia, I told her. I married you because you were pregnant with our child. I wanted to give that child, Michael, a secure future. You just ruined that. If you hadn't been pregnant, I never would have married you. I didn't bother stalling. She had to feel as bad as I did. No, Mia, I continued. To me, you weren't the kind of woman I wanted to have as a wife. Sure, we had fun. But life, especially as a parent, comes with certain obligations. That obligation is to responsibly raise your children to become productive members of society. I wasn't sure about you taking on that responsibility, I continued. But you surprised me. I have to say, you've done a great job of being a mother. Although I can't say you've done particularly well as a wife. Now I'm tired. I'm going to go sleep in the basement on the futon. For now. Patrick, I'm so sorry, she sobbed. One last thing, I said, ignoring her apology. She looked at me hopefully. You should probably hire a lawyer, I told her. And I could hear her sobbing as I walked toward the basement. Next part. Somehow life went on almost as if her cheating hadn't happened. Almost. We were still all living together under the same roof. For the kids, their world was normal. Mom and dad and the kids living together. They might not have noticed that I rarely spoke to Mia. And there was absolutely no physical interaction. No hugs. No holding hands. No kisses goodbye. There was almost no dialogue unless it was absolutely necessary. That's not to say Mia didn't try. In the evening, as the kids fell asleep, she apologized over and over again. To any attempt at physical contact, I objected and turned a blind eye. It was as if we lived in two worlds. One world when the kids were awake, trying to maintain a sense of normalcy. And in the moments when Mia and I were alone, there was a cold war going on in our relationship. It wasn't the most pleasant of environments. A dark time in my life. And it got worse. No, our family with the described dysfunction continued to exist. But there was something else that darkened the atmosphere of my life. It was Ryan. He was now on full hospice care. The doctor said his life should be measured in days. I visited him, and Teresa tried to keep her spirits upbeat. But it didn't take much to shatter the facade of positivity. One day, near the end, I sat with Ryan as he dozed off. I was quiet, just sitting there, when suddenly Ryan grabbed my shirt sleeve with unexpected force. I looked up at him, and for a moment his eyes cleared. Promise me, he whispered. Patrick, promise me, he repeated. Anything. I nodded my head, ready to do whatever it took. It took him a moment to gather his strength, but finally he whispered. Take care of Teresa. I promised him I would. Three days later, Ryan died. The funeral was sad and pleasant all at the same time. I spoke briefly about our friendship and what a good man he was. And then life went on. Sort of. There was a child-related atmosphere at home. Mia continued to be a good mother. On my advice, she continued to work at Langley Motors, and Mia's mom was at our house regularly. 
My job was to maintain a sense of normalcy for the kids, but behind the scenes, things were happening. That Tuesday night, I met with Myron Overby to discuss options for ending the marriage. What he told me was not encouraging. Next part. The stress Mia was experiencing was constant. The only relief was the short stretches of sleep caused by overwork. Even the joy of interacting with the children was stressful. Mia was constantly pushing herself. If I'm not a good enough mother, Patrick won't need me. Mia remembered the awful conversation with Patrick after that terrible trip to Denver. He had been so cold. He had told her that if she hadn't been pregnant, he would never have married her. It was a sharp knife that went exactly on target. He accused her of sabotaging the future, stability, and happiness of the children by her actions. She was constantly pressured to correct her mistake. Mistakes. She had to make up for her mistakes by becoming the best mother she could be. And that was difficult. She tried to talk to Lisa, her best and oldest friend. But Lisa called her names and told her she had ruined her marriage. Eventually, she told her she didn't want to talk to her anymore. Fortunately, she kept her job at Langley Motors, but she was called into Blake's office and told that she was not to socialize with Mitch. Mitch had been demoted, and Mia noticed that he was now avoiding her. It was probably for the best, but the whole company knew about the affair with Mitch. She knew about it and had even heard some of the hurtful gossip. It was embarrassing. If she had a choice, she would have quit. But Patrick said she needed the money. Eh? The only person she could really talk to was her mother. She could discuss her actions and the precarious state of her marriage. But although her mother was great with the children and a good cook, she didn't understand the situation. Patrick will come to his senses. In time, he will learn to forgive you, she would tell Mia. To Mia, all of this was incredibly unlikely. Mia summed up her life this way. A failed marriage, an awkward work environment, and constant pressure at home to be the perfect mother. All because she was having fun with a guy who, in retrospect, she didn't really like. And by the way, he was married to her now ex-best friend. Next part. It's likely you'll get joint custody, Myron told me. But it's also likely that if you keep the house, your wife will retain the right to live in it. If you sell the house, the proceeds will be split, and there will probably be enough for each of you to buy a small house or condominium. I sat there thinking. I loved this house. It was perfect for the kids. They were already starting to make friendships in the neighborhood. The school they went to wasn't too far away either. I remembered how we bought this house and how perfect it was for our family. I continued to sit in Myron's office, absent-mindedly tapping my fingertips on the surface of the desk and reflecting on the fact that I'd made a lot of bad decisions in my life. The thought of taking the kids out of their home and forcing them to live in some cramped apartment wasn't what I wanted. There may be another option, Myron paused. It's becoming more and more popular, but given the circumstances, it's not ideal. I looked at him, nodding silently for him to continue. Myron told me he could draw up a post-nuptial agreement. Of course, I had heard of a prenuptial agreement, but not that. Myron explained that it's a document for a married couple that outlines a series of legal agreements between husband and wife to protect them financially and personally. What should be in this document? I asked. He explained that whatever we both decide. But it would be a decision about the kids and the house. Essentially, we would stay married. Financially, we would have our own accounts, investments, and pensions. Monthly expenses would be shared in proportion to our income. In a few years, when the kids are older, we would equitably split the cost of the house. Specifically, once the twins turn 18, the house would be sold and the profits divided 50-50, unless we both agreed to keep it. But if either of us wanted to leave, the house would be sold. The other thing that would happen at that point is either of us would have the choice to end the marriage uncontested. The property would be split 50-50, and either of us would have the option to buy the other's share of the house at a reduced price. Otherwise, everything would be divided as outlined above. We would act as cohabiting spouses. In addition, there would be stipulations regarding guests. Neither of us could bring a couple into the house. Any outside romantic relationships were to remain private, with no exposure to the spouse or children. We discussed this some more. It wasn't ideal, but it was probably the least bad alternative. I asked Myron to prepare something while I mulled over this option. Perhaps someday, much later in adulthood, the kids will realize the sacrifices they made for their stability, I thought. Next part. I couldn't believe it. When Patrick walked into the kitchen carrying a large envelope, I assumed it was a divorce document. Tears came to my eyes as he began to speak, and I realized I was wrong. This document was something else. The gist of it was that we would both stay in the house. 
He would finish the room in the basement adjacent to his office. And that would be his bedroom. At least for now. We'll still be married. But more like roommates. There were many more details, but most of them wouldn't reveal themselves until years later. I wasn't going to worry about all of that now. I'm sure I'll have a chance to change some things by then. It was the lifeline I needed. There were a whole bunch of rules and regulations that I happily agreed to. In fact, I didn't even read them all the way through. I signed the document before Patrick had even finished explaining it to me. Outwardly, I was happy because we wouldn't be sharing the kids and we wouldn't have to sell the house. Secretly, I hoped I could get it back. I thought back to when we broke up right after college graduation. I was able to get him back then. I felt like I had a chance to do it again. Next part. It was a little awkward at first. I was still very angry at her betrayal. Seeing her every day and acting so normal was uncomfortable. Although I treated the children with warmth and love, I tried to discreetly ignore Mia. I set aside a space in the basement next to my office and set up a bedroom there. It didn't seem abnormal to the children, and their lives continued to flow serenely, unaware of the crack in their parents' relationship. That was the deal Mia and I had made, and it was written into the prenuptial agreement. The priority was the children's future and happiness. There was a price we both had to pay to preserve their lives. One of the problems was that it was not easy to make any acquaintances. I quickly discovered that one of the first questions a potential woman I approach asks is, Are you married? Next, by the beginning of the second sentence after I started with, Yes, but the woman was gone. The only potential option would be someone I already knew well and who had the patience to understand the situation. Unfortunately, there aren't many of those around here. Of course, one of the sacrifices I had to make was not having any kind of relationship. As time went on, it became more and more difficult. Next part. Patrick was still a little angry. Even though we did everything together as a family and usually had dinner together, he seemed to focus all of his attention on the kids. It was okay for now, but I wanted our old life back. When we were together. That's okay, I thought. I was playing the long game. I had time. I'd done this once before, and I knew him so well that I was sure I could get him back. And I had a strategy. Next part. On Friday nights, I usually met up with a couple of unmarried buddies at the Red Cab, a sports bar with an upscale pickup lounge. The guys and I liked the place because of the big screens and the random attractive women who liked it too. The problem was that most people who knew me, and there were quite a few, knew I was married. When I tried to explain that my wife and I were in an open marriage, it sounded even more disgusting. Suffice it to say that any of the women, knowing my situation, who might be interested in me, were generally uninterested in me. It reminded me of the old Groucho Marx line, I wouldn't want to join a club of which I was a member, or something to that effect. It caused me frustration in many ways, Next part. It had been months, and I was still playing this game at home. Yes, I realized that the kids were the number one priority, but I felt like things were getting better with Patrick as well. He wasn't as rude to me when the kids weren't around, and I noticed that he was paying attention to me. I was sure he found me attractive. He always did. I was also sure he wasn't seeing anyone else. Of course I wasn't sure, but except for Fridays, when he sometimes went to caboose, he was usually home in the evening. I began to formulate a plan. I knew that after he'd had a couple drinks, he was usually interested in one thing. Of course, I knew about his habits from when we were married. It was a Friday night when he was out with the guys at Red Caboose. I was dressed only in a towel, as if I had just showered. I knew he usually got home around 11, 11.30. Looking out the window, I saw an Uber turn onto our street. I hurried to the refrigerator. I strategically placed a corner of a towel in the fridge, closing the door on the corner. I grabbed my water bottle. I waited. I heard the door open and realized I had to be on time. I heard him round the corner and move into the kitchen. Oh, I said fearfully, and got up from my spot in the fridge. Oops. You scared me, I told him. He silently walked over to me and we got down to it. Next part. Things progressed without much incident. Except for the time I caught her in the kitchen one Friday, our relationship was platonic. She was still a beautiful woman but I needed something more in a relationship. All of my close friends knew about Mia and my situation. Days turned into weeks. Weeks turned into months. And suddenly the dysfunction in our lives became the norm. I treated Mia from neutral to pleasant, and she was very nice to me. Those months turned into years. Mia's mother was still helping, and Mia continued to work, and quite successfully, at Langley Motors. The children went to school and life went on as usual. 
Suddenly, I discovered a welcome change in my life. It was so sudden that it surprised me. Next part. Time passed, but it was a pleasant one. I loved my children. And now that the twins had gone to school, there was normalcy in my life and I felt lucky. My job was great. Mitch had moved to California, so I no longer had to confront him and remember my mistake. I needed to somehow patch things up with Patrick. He seemed in an elevated mood lately, happier. Sometimes, when all the guys had things to do, it was just him and me. They were pleasant and friendly, but any attempt at physical contact he avoided. He stopped going to the caboose with his buddies. He was more at home. He started going out in the evenings, leaving the house after dinner for a couple hours too, three nights a week. I would ask where he went and he would just say around. It was fine. I was just glad he wasn't hanging out with all the girls at the bar. The positive mood continued. The elevated mood coincided with his new habit of walking and leaving bars. My mood mirrored his, and I was happier. He was friendly and good-natured around me. I think things were getting better between us. Slowly, but getting better. On rare occasions, he gave me a goodbye kiss. More like a gentle peck on the cheek. Sisterly. Every now and then I tried to turn around to touch my lips to his. But he avoided it and just laughed lightly as if it was a joke. I was frustrated with the stagnation in my relationship with Patrick. But on the other hand, we were still living together. My mom cheered me up too. She reassured me with positive comments. Sometimes these things take time, she said. But I can see he cares about you. I was always encouraged by her comments. I just hoped they were true. The years dragged on. Everything stayed the same. Suddenly, it seemed, Michael left for college, and the dynamics in the house changed. The twins were busy with school, activities, friends, and boyfriends. Patrick and I were busy with work. But one night, Patrick said we needed to go on a family vacation to celebrate the twins' graduation from high school. In all those years, we had never traveled together. That was progress, I thought. I'd like to take your mom with me, too, Patrick told me. She was definitely a part of our lives, and on the one hand, I was glad Patrick was taking mom. But on the other hand, I thought it might be a chance for him and me to increase our intimacy. Three days later, mom was in the house when I came home from work. She seemed agitated about something. She might have interrupted. Did you know about this? She asked, with a wide smile on her face. What? I asked. She smiled and handed me a few printed pages of paper. When we talked to the twins about a vacation, they both agreed to Disneyland. Even though they were on the cusp of adulthood, they were still kids at heart and that was where they wanted to go. Apparently, my mom had been going through Patrick's office while he was out of town. I looked over the travel documents to Southern California and the details of the Disneyland trip. I knew all of this, but what had my mom so excited about? I looked up. Keep reading, she told me. At first, I didn't understand. After Disneyland, the two of them had further travel plans, to Hawaii. I continued reading, The Hapuna Beach Hotel on the Big Island, for two. The trip was to be right after the Disneyland trip, a week in Hawaii. I finally understood what my mom was so excited about. It was a surprise trip for the two of us. There were no flight papers in the printed sheets, but the hotel and rental car were booked. Suddenly, I was excited too. This was a surprise to me. Mom, I began, you have to put all this stuff back exactly as you found it. That night, Patrick called me from his meeting. He said he wanted to talk to me about something, but not over the phone. I happily agreed. He said he would be home the next night and suggested we have dinner at the Pasta House, a small Italian restaurant where we used to go. I was delighted. He's going to tell me about the trip to Hawaii, I thought. Next part. I got home Friday afternoon. Mia was still at work. I texted her. I have an errand to run. Meet me at Pasta House at 6.30. I walked out of the house bouncing in place. I was nervous and excited. Next part. As I walked down the sidewalk to the Pasta House, I saw him sitting at a kiosk. In the vacant seat next to him, I saw that he had something, probably a document. It must be about a trip to Hawaii. I smiled widely, sitting down. I wanted to kiss him, but it was a little awkward, so I just sat down. How was the trip? I asked, and we spent a few minutes making small talk. There was a lull, and Patrick began to narrate. Next part. Mia, as you know, our relationship over the years, I began, after the whole Mitch thing, has been unconventional. To put it mildly, Mia silently half-smiled and nodded in agreement. But despite all the conflicts, we found a way to work things out. We've both sacrificed ourselves for the stability of the kids. And look at them, I said with a smile. 
Michael is getting his engineering degree, Cleo got into Stanford, and Claire is going to Notre Dame. We both have a lot to be proud of, I told her. At that moment, I reached down, picked up the papers, and placed them on the table. Mia, still smiling, looked at the materials, and then her face changed. She looked embarrassed. Now that the twins have graduated, I have fulfilled the terms of our post-nuptial agreement. Now you can date without worrying about the kids. In 60 days, we'll be legally divorced. She looked at me stunned. Mia, you will always be a part of my life. There were times when I was really mad at you, but over the years I've mostly gotten over it, I told her. I consider you a good friend, I told her cheerfully. She stared at me, her smile replaced by a confused frown. Friends? Divorce? Patrick, I'm in love with you. She almost shouted. I don't want a divorce. I looked at her puzzled. Mia, the prenuptial agreement spells it all out. Here it is, I said and held out the papers to her. You agreed to this. Here's your signature of consent, I said and pointed to the bottom of the page. But what about the trip to Hawaii? She asked with desperation in her voice. She asked with desperation in her voice. Hawaii, said I. Now I was confused. How did you know about going to Hawaii? She sat there without answering. I'm going to Hawaii with Teresa, I told her. Teresa? She almost screamed. Next part. Right after Ryan died, I spent a lot of time with Teresa. Despite the difficulties I was having with Mia, I knew I had to support Teresa. For several months, I visited their home several times a week. I remembered the promise I had made to Ryan in those last days. But after a while, it started to weigh on me. It was awkward, and at first I didn't understand why. I know a lot of it was sadness over losing my girlfriend, but it was more than that. My feelings for her were becoming romanticized. It felt like a betrayal towards my deceased friend. So I stopped visiting Teresa. This was around the time I started hanging out at the Red Cabin. It was an empty time in my life. I didn't have any acquaintances, and I remembered the one time I had a spontaneous encounter with Mia. I immediately realized it was a mistake. I started a different lifestyle, promising myself to be healthy. I focused on my children and my work. Fortunately, both of these areas of my life were working out well. Around this time, I started walking a few miles after dinner, two, three times a week. My route took me past Teresa and Ryan's house. Well, just Teresa's now. But I couldn't help but think of him whenever I passed by. As I walked by one summer evening, I saw her watering the flower pots on the porch. We struck up a conversation and she joined me on my walk. It became a habit, and we started walking regularly. Since we spent a lot of time together, it was hard for me not to notice how attractive Teresa was. I would tell myself off. This was the wife of a good friend of mine who had passed away. I remembered the promise I had made to him. It had been several years since I'd been in contact with Teresa. According to the marriage contract, I did not mix my home life with my friendship with Teresa. It was separate and not discussed. In essence, it was my family's secret. My love for Teresa grew, and our friendship grew stronger and stronger. We got into the habit of hugging each other goodbye. I had to keep reminding myself that she was Ryan's widow. One summer evening, we were out walking and suddenly it started raining. We were the farthest distance from her house, so by the time we got back, we were both soaked and cold. You open the wine, Teresa told me, and I'll take a quick shower. Um. While I was in the kitchen with the wine, I heard her say something from the hallway. What? I said back to her. I couldn't hear what she said. I said, could you please get me a towel? They're in the laundry room. Walking toward the laundry room, I had mixed feelings. Attraction, guilt, and of course, desire. Um... I started. Do you want me to leave this here? I asked uncertainly. Instead of grabbing the towel, she grabbed my hand and pulled me into the bathroom. You can imagine what happened next. The next day, when I went to Teresa's house, it was awkward. Almost all of it on my part. After about ten minutes of my strange behavior, she asked what was wrong. She asked what was the matter. Good thing our friendship was strong enough to have conversations like that. I think I'm cheating on Ryan, I finally told her. She paused and studied me. I want to tell you about one of our recent conversations, Teresa began. She told me that Ryan had told her that he felt guilty about the death. He felt like he was letting her down. Promise me you'll find a good man to spend the rest of your life with, he told her. She protested and said that no one could take his place. Holding her hand, he slowly closed his eyes and then opened them with surprising strength and, smiling weakly, whispered, Patrick, you see, she said to me, he has already given us his blessing. Next part. 
A few years passed, the twins were still in college, and the big day came for Michael. The prenup had gone smoothly. Myron had done a good job. Mia tried to protest, but the agreement was firm. Teresa and I got married. It was a small affair. Teresa's brother Tim, a good friend of mine, was my best man. I moved into Teresa's house. I still thought of it as Teresa and Ryan's house couldn't help it. And Mia kept our family home. Michael married his college girlfriend, Bridget. She was a wonderful girl, and I was glad they were together. It was late in the evening at the reception. I found myself alone at the table, having perhaps had one too many glasses of champagne, and looked around at those gathered, quite pleased. It was obviously a happy day for Michael, and I watched him and Bridget dance. Claire was dancing with her boyfriend, a big guy, Daniel, who played soccer at Notre Dame. I liked him. And Cleo was applying to medical school and claimed she had no time for men. She danced alone, next to her sister. Teresa was as beautiful as ever, and I could see her enjoying socializing with a group of people. I was in an uplifted, satisfied state of mind. Just then, I felt someone sit down in the unoccupied chair next to me. It was Mia. I turned and looked at her. She had gained weight, and the stresses of life were evident on her face. She had aged. Having a good time? I asked pleasantly. Since our conversation at Pasta House, our relationship had been strained. She acted like she was mad at me. Yeah, I guess. She said, I'm really happy for Michael. He's a good guy and he's marrying the right woman. There was a lull in the conversation. Everyone left to their own opinions. And then I looked over and saw silent tears streaming down Michael's face. What happened? I asked. Mia, you were a great mother, said I, trying to cheer her up. Maybe a good mother, she said without looking at me. But not such a good wife. The end. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. So subscribe to my channel and watch the next video.